Don't you understand anything? My daughter Jen screamed at me as tears streamed from her reddening eyes. This isn't real. I'm dead. You're dealing with confused thoughts right now, I said. Her dark eyes blazed like smoldering mahogany. She glanced over my shoulder, nervously running her fingers through my straight black hair. We stood in the kitchen together. I knew Jen was watching the front door, which was only about 20 feet away through the living room. The kitchen's clean. Tiled floors sparkled in the summer sunlight streaming in through the windows. I'm leaving, Jen spat defiantly at me, keeping her eye on the price. Get out of my way. You have had a car accident and a concussion, I said patiently. Do you not trust me? Your own father? Doctor wants you to rest and get better. And he wants you to take your pills. Jen's head ratcheted toward her eyes widening. The tears started flowing faster and heavier from her squinting, pain-filled eyes. She muttered something and disparaging under her breath about the pills. Dad, you know I love you, she said. But no one believes me. Not even you. I can prove it to you, though. I sighed, giving her a faint trace of smile. Okay, so prove it to me that you're dead, a walking corpse. I responded. She nodded grimly, wiping away the tears flowing down her cheek collarbone. Her high cheekbones and long dark eyelashes. I stood there like a guard on sentry duty, blocking the front entryway leading out of the kitchen. Jen leaned her back against the kitchen sink, apparently resting, her eyelids clenched shut. Her long fingers started to crawl over the countertop like spider, moving slow, eerie jerks. She had lost so much weight that her fingers looked sharp, skeletal. I had no doubt in mind that Jen was just suffering a temporary psychotic break. After all, she had gotten into a terrible car crash two days ago that had caused a concussion. The tips of her fingers traced in the metal sink. Her eyes rolled back in her head as she grabbed a sharp stick knife from the drying rack. I sprinted forward as she raised it to her neck. I shrieked at her in incomprehensible gibberish. As the sharp edge of the blade closed the distance to her jugular, I leapt towards her. I jumped farther and faster than I ever imagined possible. Soaring through the air as shivering torrents of adrenaline rushed, raced through every inch of my body. Even the tips of my fingers and toes seemed to vibrate with manic energy and trembling apprehension. I felt my body crash into Jen's, her right arm, when flying out to the side, the knife soared through the air before clattering on the white tiled floor. Jen's eyes flew open, a deep sense of anger distorting her features. I would have shown you, she cried. Her voice dissolving into broken shards of hopelessness. I can't die, don't you see? I can cut myself, but it just heals within a couple seconds. She leaned close to me, as if whispering a great cosmic secret. But her eyes stayed wide and sad. Dad, I died during the car crash. I felt it happen. I saw my body from above. The crushed skull. The great gods of blood. I could see pieces of my own brain. The car had flipped the passenger side was laying on the road. I heard singing from above, harmonizing voice that rang down from the heaven. Tunnel of white sparkling spinning light formed above there while I was floating. I glanced back down at my body one last time, but now I wasn't alone. There was something, something slinking forward with a hunched back. The creature couldn't have been more than four feet tall. Like some mutated dwarf from hell, its skin shone dull and flat. It's the color of old model steel. Black, bristling quills like those of a porcupine grew from its head. It's, it had some strange dark leather covering its whole body except for its hand and its head. Its hands had small stubby fingers with black claws growing out of the ends. Reacher loomed next to the car, looking down at my body in the driver's seat with a gleam of amusement, cackling in a raspy tone. It raised its voice. It raised its head and looked down straight at me. As I floated gently in the air, I saw its face in its entirety that its eyes looked like swirling orbs of cy cyanotic blue. It had a large hooked nose, its black, withered lips pulled apart with a crackling sound. Its mouth opened wide, that sickening blue light poured out of its head. It spiraled around him like a snake, rising up in the air in double helix pattern. I watched as the cold azure twister approaching my ghost body in horror. I fiercely reached the tunnel of the white light above me. I tried to float up into the peaceful radiance where angelic voices sang, and pain had no hold. 
but the cold blue tendrils grabbed my ankles and pulled me back down. I woke up in the car then, alone. I didn't have a mark on my body. How is that possible? I saw the condition of the car. No one should have been able to survive that accident. Yet, not only did I survive, but I didn't get a single scrape or bruise. But that wasn't it. When I was trying to climb straight out of the car through the shattered driver's side window, I snagged my arm on a piece of twisted metal. I winced as it bit through the skin, leaving a gash a few inches long from long down the side of my wrist. Yet no blood came out, not a single drop. As I glanced down at the wound, I saw the skin shifting and reforming as if it were made of latex. It slowly stretched itself out, covering the crimson gash. Within a few seconds, there wasn't a sign of it, not a mark, a scab, or a scar to be seen. How do you explain that? I looked over at the bottle of the antipsychotics on the counter. The doctor had written her a prescription yesterday and after hearing about her experience. He had pulled to the side and said, This is classic Cotard syndrome. I don't know why she's experiencing it since usually the syndrome occurs in schizophrenics or people with psychotic depression. She has no history of either. However, and that was about all the good doctor would say. No, he said, he didn't know how long it would take for her to recover. In fact, he couldn't guarantee that she would ever recover. Why do you think this creature would target you, Jen? I asked. It sounds like it made you immortal and immune from injury. Why on earth would it go out of its way to do that to a total stranger for free? Her face went pale as she heaved a deep sigh. Bradley got us to try some new stuff out, Jen admitted sheepishly, talking about her boyfriend. Some occult stuff, I guess you could say. I thought it was all joke. We took acid and tried using some Ouija board and going to old cemeteries and stuff, but nothing happened. Then someone sent him a copy of some ancient book on the dark web. It was some medieval occult book that was nearly impossible to find. Bradley saw a spell for immortality, and we decided to try it out. It was a lot more complicated than anything we had done. It took part of the drop of our blood, and the root cutting of the datura plant, the manita muscaria mushroom, and dirt from the grave of an infant, and some other weird stuff. We're supposed to mix it all into a broth and drink it. Bradley changed his mind at the last second. However, he got scared and wouldn't touch it. I drank it though. I fell into some technicolor floating sleep. And that was when I first saw the creature with the blue light shining from its eyes. For some reason, I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach as Jen recounted her story. I knew it was all insane, but the fact that she truly believed it on a subconscious level seemed obvious. I opened my mouth to try to convince her that she would take the antipsychotic pills the doctor had given her to see if they helped, but I never got a chance. A soft rhythmic tapping began at the front door. I glanced out of the kitchen below, but I only saw the blood-red glow of the sunset beyond. A fragrant summer breeze blew in through the screen reminiscent of flowers and freshly cut grass. Who could that be? I asked, looking at the time. It was already 8pm. I wasn't expecting anyone. And I walked toward the front door, but Jen ran up behind me, hissing in my ear. Don't, she insisted. I have a bad feeling about this. Jen, we can't live afraid of everything in life, I said as I opened the door. On the front porch, I saw a hunchback dwarf with radiant cobalt eyes. Behind him loomed the naked bodies of a dozen rotting corpses. And yet, they stood on their feet, breathing in sickly rasping gasps. Their eyes looked filmy and blue like the eyes of a drowned corpse. Sores eaten into their skin revealed the rotting muscle and fat underneath. They smelt like old rotted cheese and sweet infection. The dwarf creature stepped forward, giving me his hand. I didn't shake it. Good evening, sir, he said respectfully, his leathery black lips stretching into a grimy smile. My name is Castelfo. I'm an acquaintance of your daughter's. Is she at home? With chattering teeth, I stepped back into the house, slammed the door shut in the door's face. Jen was standing next to the door, shaking her crying. Call the cops, I whispered. Jen, get help. What the hell do you think you're doing? Tapping began at the door again, harder this time. It continued, growing louder and insistent until the door shook in its frame with every blow. I feared it would splinter into a million pieces under the stain. No use, no use, Jen cried, hovering her face. The entire front wall of the house shook now, every couple seconds. He'll find us. He always finds us. 
The door exploded inwards as if someone had taken a medieval bathroom ram to it. Chunks of wood rained down on my head. Sorry about that. Castelfo said innocently as he slunk into the house, the army of rotting bodies following closely behind him. But a deal is a deal. After all, I'm only coming to collect. Collect what? I hissed. My heart pal- My heart palpitating in my chest. Streams of cold sweat ran down my face. Your daughter, of course, he said, giving me a sadistic smile. She asked for immortality and I granted it. In exchange, she must spend eternity working for me. I gave all these other ones immortality as well, after all. He gestured to the naked corpses of men and women that surrounded him like a brain dead puppets. His smile disappeared like the mist under a summer sun. Grab her, he commanded the undead. With blank expressions on their lipless, mutilated faces, they closed in on Jen. She pulled out a pocket knife, flipping it open. No! Stay away from me! She screamed. The first corpse jumped at her, the sores on its arm leaking strange fluids as its finger wrapped around her neck. With a gargling cry, she raised the knife, high and brought it down at the undead creature's jugular. Blood of the color of granite dripped languidly down the slice of the few moments. And then, before my eyes, it started to seal itself back up, the skin stretching and dancing, until the wound had faded into nothing. I don't want to look like those things, Jen whispered in horror as they surrounded her. I felt shell-shocked. I wanted to run into the crowd of undead to save her, but I was outnumbered, and afraid they would simply kill me. Would I rot too? Oh yes, he cackled in a sing-song tone. They rot, you rot too. We all rot in the end. Their bodies may be able to heal physical wounds, but no one can stop time forever. Jen's hair had started to fall out. I noticed her skin looked looser. It seemed the first subtle signs of her decay had already begun. Talfa turned to me and nodded briskly. I believe my business here is done, he said immediately. Blue light fluttered and spun out of his mouth with every word he spoke. Good evening then. I'm truly sorry about the door. He motioned for his undead puppets to take Jen outside with them. As he walked to the threshold, I started like a man, waking up from a night from a nightmare. You are not taking my daughter, I shrieked, rushing at the dwarf behind. I heard a slight tinkling laughter as my body smashed into his. A burning jolt of blue electricity jumped from his skin to my hands, running up my arms like fire. I tried to scream in pain, but all my muscles had locked up. I fell on the living room floor, kicking and seizing. A car pulled up to the front of the house. From the corner of my eye, I saw Jen's boyfriend, Bradley, get out. He stood on the sidewalk, looked at the shattered door. He took a shotgun out of the car. Stop, you bastard! Bradley screamed at the dwarf. But Gustavo only gave a faint smile and kept walking. You think you can hurt me with the little toys? He asked. Bradley returned his grin. These bullets have cold iron pellets in every shot, he exclaimed with glee, firing at Castalfo. The dwarf shrieked in pain as quarter-sized holes opened up all over his body. Black blood spattered the white pillars of the brooch. The undead rushed forward to protect their master, storming towards Bradley. He kept firing, dropping three of them on the way, but the others knocked him down. Crawling on all fours, they surrounded him, ripping at his flesh with their rotted jagged teeth. He gave a cry of pure agony as one started eating his eyes. Jen was crying on the front porch when they had dropped her. I ran over to her, grabbing by her by the arm. Time to go, I whispered. Pulling her towards the garage and my SUV, I pushed her into the passenger seat and started the car, peeling out of there as fast as I could. As I looked back, I saw the remains of Bradley's body. His face had become a mask of gore, ragged strips of flesh. His intestines hung over the bushes in the yard like Christmas tinsel. He saved Jen's life, and maybe mine as well. But I don't think that's the end. I have a feeling that Castalfo will be back, and next time, he won't fail.